thing about my years in Zimbabwe were about the vastness of the horizon. It was the only horizon I knew. And it wasn't until I came to Boston and then England that I saw how small the horizon was. Uh, also, I remember as a child in the evening running around the house and then collapsing and lying on the grass, smelling the grass uh, that's been cut and staring at the sky that was full of stars. And now when I go out on my balcony, I'm lucky if I can see two stars. student I loved played in bands for years, uh, playing in ensembles and then in professional bands, some dance bands which I hated at the time. These things all taught me a way and there seemed to be a strict way and that's the way the leader wanted. And I kept finding that changing in me. This is not kind of a rigid thing I discovered but I feel that any group of players it, you know, football or uh, any group, there is a there is contained in it a, a single personality or characteristic characteristics, which add up to its personality. And uh, when I meet a band for the first time, it's not defined or even known because sometimes those bands, have, those people, haven't met each other. But I want to bring that out, and my. My feeling is it's the personality, the characteristics, the weaknesses and strengths that communicate with the audience. A, a common one that I get in England is, where should we come off in this bar? On three or after three? On the third beat? Or, and I usually don't answer it directly. I'll say, well, if it's the lead trombone player, I'll say, uh, choose a place. Find what's comfortable for you. Exactly. They, they don't like that very much. They want to be told. And if it's not the lead, I'll say, listen to the lead and follow. I discovered for, for myself only two years ago, Carlos Kleiber, a, a conductor, he died in 2004 and I, I was so sad to be discovering him so long after he died because I would love to have seen him. I've met people who've played under him and they just go, oh, you know, Carlos Kleiber. Even the f most famous conductors see him as the best. He was offered the, be uh, the Berlin Philharmonic job and he didn't, he was never, a, affiliated with a particular orchestra, Vienna Symphony Orchestra, maybe. Anyway, one player asked him once, I read this somewhere, asked him, it was a very quiet piece that the first note was inaudible and it, the whole orchestra, 100, it, the sound emerges. So there's no kind of ictus for the beginning. And the one player said, I don't know where to come in. He said, listen to your neighbor. When you hear your neighbor come in, <laughs> that was so perfect. Now, I only read that two years ago, but I had been finding that many times when I was asked a question, I somehow threw it back to the person so that they had to on answer it. I only discovered this in myself late, you know, I was doing it instinctively, not by design. This sort of attitude allows the, whatever the characteristic of the band as a unit is to emerge slightly, to a great degree or a lesser degree. So if I can, I come into rehearsal with um, the same arrangements I've done somewhere else, uh, and I'm playing the same music, but it changes depending on the characteristics, if I allow it to come through. If I come into each one and say, it, you must do it my way, 
Uh, you know, that might work, I and mean, I'm sure it's worked for other people, but it doesn't work for me. Eberhard Weber had his big jubilee celebration for his 75th. The piece I had chosen from his repertoire was uh, Mauritius. And I, what I did was I took the same shape, you know, the arrangement of the shape of the piece and orchestrated that for the big band. I expect in the tradition of big bands, you know, that there's a strong lead trumpet player and the lead trumpet player is sort of the unofficial leader of the whole band. I've worked with bands that are established bands and I've worked with bands that are, that a lot of them hadn't met each other before this. But it's, but it's the same process I find with bands. I worked for years with Derek Watkins. I mean, and I was already playing. He was a, the, the young whiz kid when he emerged. But I've worked with him over years, and and of course he's done much more than than I was. I was I was just the third trombone player, but but I watched him work, and I, I remember a piece I, I I did the arrangement quickly, and I made a little mistake at the end with the rhythm. I wrote it in half time, okay. and when we got to the end, I said, "Oh, stop, stop, stop!" And as I said, "Stop," a, a saxophone player had a question. So before I addressed my mistake. I turned to the sax and I, I could sense that it was a short question. I, I said, what, what's the problem? He said something and I fixed it in 20 okay, seconds. Yeah. And then I turned to Derek and I said, oh Derek, he said, it's okay, I fixed it. Right. He was way ahead of me. He not only fixed it, he had already fixed it and told the others. Okay. You know, he, it was a rhythmic thing, it had to be doubled. And right. uh, Now this is a, a, a leader, so every band needs one of them. Bill Frizzell's wife is an artist, and she goes every year for a month to a, a retreat sort of place where to, to just work. But Bill goes as well, and he's the only composer. Apparently. Steve Swallow goes for three months of the year. It's, it seems extraordinarily it was there to a, a, a very out of the way Caribbean island to compose. This is sort of a, a version of that, a place for artists to go. Yeah. And it's full of history. I mean, uh, it's beautiful. I, I mean, a lovely place, a lovely part of the country, a, a lovely uh, building, and not just building, but buildings, a nice yeah. place. And, and, and also the community is all the guys in the band, so it's got a really nice social yeah. aspect. Thank <laughs> you. 